Hello, everyone. My name is Elsa Olivetti, and I'm a professor of material science and engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I welcome you all to this webinar, which is organized by the International Society for Industrial Ecology, working in close collaboration with MTNU Sustainability, as well, of course, as the International Resource Panel. So this webinar is one of two webinars to introduce the report, Resource Efficiency and Climate Change, Material Efficiency Strategies for a low carbon future. The webinar right now is going to focus on the methods used to produce the quantitative results as well as the results themselves. So today we get to get some insights into the modeling that was used in this report. We're going to hear from the various researchers involved in the modeling and I'll introduce them as we go. You can see the rough outline will have about 10 minutes presentation from each of these individuals. Then next week on the 26th of February, a second webinar will introduce the policy review chapter of the report and invited policymakers will discuss the implications of the report. The, this set of information shown on this slide in terms of accessing the report, as well as the website links for the two organizing uh, entities, as well as this information on the follow up webinar will be added to the chat. So before we begin, I want to just give you a couple of items of business. First, to let every know, everyone know that the session will be recorded and we'll be sharing it afterwards. I would also like to make the request that you all add your questions through the Q&A function of the session. Please feel free to add questions throughout. And if speakers have a chance, they'll answer after each of their sessions, but we'll take time for questions at the end. So please feel free to populate your questions as we go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Edgar Hertwig, who's a professor of industrial ecology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, as well as a member of the International Resource Panel. So he has directed this study. He's going to talk about the carbon footprint of materials and the need to model material efficiency. Please, Edgar, take it away. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, the carbon footprint of materials. Uh, and this is a study that was just released. Um, and so let me uh, tell you why we looked into this issue. Uh, it's of course important if you're interested in the connection between material use and climate change. Uh, prior okay. estimate, uh, so prior estimates of the carbon footprint uh, of materials um, rely partly on work of the IEA. The IEA, however, doesn't specify uh, all the greenhouse gas emissions associated uh, with materials production, rather just the direct emissions of the production processes uh, and the energy use that is connected to materials production. The other source of prior information was life cycle assessment of individual materials production processes uh, that were sort of conducted uh, on a, in a top-down, uh, bottom-up fashion, so from individual processes and then upscaled by production volumes. Um, and, and that, of course, has a significant source of uncertainty associated with it, because you don't know how representative the individual processes that were investigated are. Uh, so what we did is that we uh, used input output information and with the newly available Excel base, which is disaggregated um, for different materials, you have the, in principle that information um, available and it provides the coverage of all the upstream things. So I would like to briefly introduce how that was done. So if you think about the in input output table here consisting uh, of an intermediate requirements matrix uh, and uh, of, of a production factor uh, matrix here and a final demand vector um, shows the inputs that are required for specific material production processes here in the blue columns. Um, and, um, and so that's great, it's there. Um, but the use of materials is throughout the economy. So materials are used both in, as intermediate inputs uh, to other processes and, and as um, demanded by final consumption. So you and me and, and, and other parts of final consumption. Um, and so um, it is uh, difficult to isolate the parts of the materials that are used 
as an input to producing other materials from the, the materials that I used as an input to produce products of final demand. And that's what I achieved uh, through a method that's called hypothetical extraction. By this extraction, uh, there is a removal of um, the uh, direct requirements and final demand of the materials themselves. And then finally, we get the emissions that are associated uh, with the production of material through the difference of the system where these things were zeroed out in the, in the original system. And this can be imagined as the things that get zeroed out actually get shifted to outside the system and produced by an identical economy. Um, so if you think again, you have the um, columns here of production inputs of all the different sectors. And if you're demanding steel here, if you zero it out and rather shift it to here, and then it is produced in this uh, part of the economy. And so this is a way of actually identifying this. Um, now I show these results. Uh, so the database covers the time period of 1995 to 2015. Um, and these are the various materials. So it's the total of materials, the global CO2 emissions, and then individual materials listed. And this is on a logarithmic scale in gigatons. Uh, so you can see here that the material starts sort of at the one to two uh, gigaton range for iron and steel uh, and cement, lime and plaster. And that these two materials have in, uh, increased quite steeply compared to most of the other uh, figures on, on this chart. Uh, a different way, this is the representation I used in the journal paper. Uh, I looked at the processes that were causing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we can see that the direct material production is important and that energy supplies the next important part. Mining itself has fairly few direct emissions. So this is the green part here um, on, on figure B. Uh, we again see the importance of the different groups of materials. And so iron and steel is quite important in addition to other metals. And then cement is the second most important thing. Uh, here we have other minerals, gla glass and other minerals being there. And then there's wood and plastic and rubber. Um, if you look at the use, if you measure the carbon footprint of the first use of materials, um, it is really striking how, the, how important the construction sector is on the bottom here and how fast it has increased or that it has increased relatively to the other uh, categories, followed by machinery and equipment and metal products and transport equipment. Of course, the first use means that a, a bunch of those materials are actually used for intermediate products like metal products that are then used further on uh, for other production processes. Uh, looking at the final demand. So this is the final demand that is driving um, the use of the materials. Um, we can see that there is a significant portion that is connected to services. So why do services require materials? You, you don't get a material when you go to the hairdresser. Well, uh, the hairdresser works in the building, right? And the building is made from materials. Um, and so, um, it, would, it turns out that the significant um, portion of the materials actually used to provide services in the economy. Um, and here, the largest bulk here is actually public administration, health and education. Um, and here you, you have manufactured goods and so on, and, and on the bottom food. Um, and this is the net increase or the net investment. Uh, so what goes uh, to actually expanding production capacity. Uh, and here we can see that construction is quite important and, and that is not surprising. Uh, grouping this by countries, um, this is a quite revealing chart uh, because we can see just how important, how much China has grown here. Um, and this is the carbon footprint of consumption that's related to the production of materials on the left. And then the carbon footprint uh, related to materials uh, that are used to produce goods that are invested. And so here we can see that, that China has, the Chinese investment is now the largest individual driver on that figure. 
you can find those results in this paper. Uh, what we took from these results uh, for our study is that residential buildings um, uh, are a, a thing that we would like to look at. Uh, given that the construction sector is the most important sector and residential buildings are actually the most important product of the construction sector, both in terms of value and in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions they cause. Um, and then we looked at the manufacturing sector and that wasn't easy. Uh, what do we do with the manufacturing sector? Um, a lot of the products that are actually produced are sort of machinery and equipment, which we have very little data for. Uh, and it's also interesting because it's an investment product, but then we actually turn to cars um, as an in individual industry. That's the most important manufacturing industry that we could identify. And um, the sum of those two products uh, uses all these important materials like various metals, uh, cement, rubber and plastic and, and wood. Um, so uh, of course, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from materials production have increased tremendously faster than other greenhouse gas emissions, for example, related to energy use. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why we don't expect that to stop anytime soon is that a lot of these production processes are actually hard to decarbonize. And that's the reason why we would like to look at material efficiency uh, as a measure to, or a strategy to reduce these greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And in order to find options to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we've looked at the life cycle of products. Products are first designed. So you have the option to make lighter products uh, using less material to provide the same product or using less greenhouse gas em emission intensive materials. Um, and then you have the option to make your production process more efficient, causing less waste during the production uh, using the product more intensively, uh, therefore requiring uh, less of the product uh, to provide the same amount of service, extending the lifetime of the product, uh, therefore needing to produce less new products to replace old products. Uh, when the product you know, gets out of repair, you can basically recover parts remanufacture them and reuse them, either as spare parts or, or new products. Um, and then finally, uh, you can look at uh, recovering the material through recycling processes. And these are the processes that we have looked at. And the way that we have done that is by building a model uh, that is a scenario model that actually creates scenarios over time that compare the use of materials to make these two products, buildings and cars. Um, and so there's a, a scenario formulation that drives the demand for a stock of products which provides the services. Um, and the scenario also defines um, what the products look like through uh, archetypes of products and influences the energy mix. And, and so there is a calculation going on uh, in which the greenhouse gas emissions over time are calculated as a fu function of uh, the scenario parameter. And vary, we vary the scenario parameters uh, in order to come up with comparative uh, scenarios that we then use in order to calculate differences between scenarios and thus quantify the contribution um, of the different strategies uh, to emissions reductions. Uh, with that, I would like to give it over uh, to my colleagues. Thank you, Edgar. We know we're among industrial ecologists that we see the Leontief matrix on slide three. So that was a wonderful framing. I appreciate that so much. Excellent. So um, next, I'm happy to introduce uh, the second speaker. And Nico, please go ahead and begin sharing your slides. Uh, Dr. Nico Herring is an adjunct associate professor at NTNU, uh, and he's also a lecturer at, at ETH Zurich. And he will tell us about the archetypal models of materials efficiency in buildings, building off of Edgar's introduction. Thank you so much, Nico. Take it away. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Edgar, for the introduction. Yes, uh, so my name is Nico Heren. 
Um, I've been the project coordinator during my time at Yale University for Edgar Hedwig for this project, uh, this UN project, the report we are looking at today. And of course, um, uh, there were a lot of people contributing to this effort. Um, so my job here was to, to um, worry about the overall model design and making sure things can connect together. But I was also um, the architect of the building uh, sector model here. And naturally there were a lot of people contributing. So Peter Barrel, Kuichi Kanoa and um, the other panelists have been contributing to this naturally. So Edgar already showed us like the rough modeling framework that we are looking at. And uh, this presentation will also connect to a few things of those. But the key job of the archetype model, which I will explain here now in this talk, is to deliver energy and material intensities to the overall stock model. Um, I, I know this is probably a lot to, to, to handle right now, but we will be coming back to these individual things throughout the different talks. Um, so we are also touching about uh, the, on the scenario formulation. So for instance, how much floor area per capita we are using. Um, the, the share of different archetypes and so on. And finally, um, of course, we, we also have um, different effects uh, for the uh, energy and environmental impacts of the building and the uh, material. One thing we need to differentiate here is on the one hand, the archetypes deliver energy and material intensity, as I said before. And the other thing is a lot of effects also happen as uh, within the stock model. Um, and something we call uh, archetype mixing. We will come back to that in a second. So let me give you briefly the rationale why we wanted to, or why we chose to use a bottom-up archetype model. So we wanted to go really hands-on and understand like what are the potential of, potentials of material efficiency strategies, um, the ones Edgar just uh, presented in his talk. And therefore we decided to have an archetype model. So a physical representation of the built environment. So we have representative buildings, idealized buildings for different types or parts of the um, entire building stock. So we have an archetype for single family homes, for multifamily homes, for different regions and so on. Um, we have a, basically a mathematical structure for this archetype. And we can now apply um, specific um, resource or material efficiency strategies to that. And something we designed here is we designed a modeling framework to calculate material impacts and energy and impacts simultaneously. So we used uh, a sophisticated energy simulation software called Energy Plus and coupled that with our own algorithms to derive the material content. The reason behind that is if you, for instance, imagine using a wooden building instead of a concrete building, um, there will be an effect also in the energy amount of the building. So that, therefore it was very important to us to have this coupled um, way of modeling the archetypes. So there are different strategies. Um, we also look at in, in the building sector. Um, the next talk will be about the uh, vehicles, um, but here specifically for the buildings, um, we looked at material substitution. So basically the argumentation here is we are replacing brick and concrete with wood, but also steel beams can be replaced partly with wood beams. Um, that is the, uh, the idea here. I will show you in a second what that means in terms of material impact. Uh, on the right-hand column here, you see the, uh, the implementation. So this is the archetype mixing I've been talking about earlier. So how many of these archetypes will be considered in the stock model? Also something we will see later on in probably in Stefan's talk. So the next strategy we look at is light weighting. So um, this is basically based a lot on the ideas of um, uh, Julian Allwood and his colleagues. So we have, uh, we see that in construction, we often have a potential to uh, squeeze the lemon further and reduce the material that go into the building. So we, um, we estimate that 15 to 20% of reinforced concrete and also steel can be reduced in buildings. We look at lifetime extension. This is, um, depends a lot on the, on the regions we look at because lifetime of buildings can differ a lot for different countries. Um, we look at reuse. So reusing building components such as wall elements, beams, uh, maybe windows, these kind of things. Uh, recycling, so increase, like um, after the end of life of materials, uh, increasing the collection rates and also making sure the stuff comes back into the construction sector. And then finally, the more intensive use. So less people, uh, sorry, more people per square meter and also using um, more urbanized buildings. So multifamily homes instead of single family homes. 
Um, as I said before, some things affect the archetypes, some, some things affect um, the, the uh, stock model. So I have denoted them here with an asterisk. So let's look at the material intensities first. Um, most important, we can see the first two columns here is uh, no material efficiency strategy. So this is our basic, our base archetype basically. So we can already see that the multifamily home is um, due to its compactness has much less um, material in terms of kilograms per square meter than the single family home. So it's already, you can consider it a more effective or a more efficient way of building buildings, um, having like uh, multifamily homes or, or uh, yeah, larger buildings. Um, then once we apply the, um, the strategy of light weighting, we can see that we can shave off uh, about 20 to 30% of the material per square meter again. Once we start substituting um, uh, brick, concrete, steel with wood, we see another reduction also in the overall, not also, um, on the one hand for the wood, for the wood share increases here, but on the other hand, also the total material um, reduces. And that is because wood has a, a lower density compared to concrete or other materials. So the overall material impact also decreases here. And then finally, we have an archetype for the combined uh, two, so much light weighted uh, and wooden buildings, basically. And now looking at the energy intensity. So this is the simulation results. Once we throw these archetypes at the energy plus model, um, we can see that um, we, we looked at different energy standards again. So the non-standard basically means a building that is not coherent, uh, consistent with current regulations, um, all the way down to zero energy buildings here, ZEB. Again, we see that the multifamily homes, and that is something we see also empirically, are more efficient simply due to their better compactness. Um, so they preserve heat within their building envelope better. Um, we simulated these archetypes for different climate zones. So for the US, for instance, we uh, used 10 different climate zones. And naturally we see, uh, for instance, here comparing Canada with Italy, that the uh, energy demand for space heating reduces significantly. Um, but also um, at the same time, the cooling demand increases. Um, and it also increases a little bit with the energy efficiency standard, but this is something I would rather consider uh, a modeling artifact. We can uh, talk about this a bit more later. So now coming to the overall results of the um, building stock model. So uh, we looked at different scenarios. I'm, I'm sorry, we haven't introduced them yet, but we looked at um, the LED scenario. Um, which is based on a paper by Arnold Gruber and his colleagues, the SSP1 and the SSP2 scenario. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Tomer Fishman, will talk about these scenarios a little bit more in his talk in a, in a few minutes. Um, but we can see like the LED scenario is basically a, um, a sufficiency scenario. So we actually see little potential to reduce the emissions further um, by means of our uh, resource efficiency strategies. But looking at the SSPs in one and two scenarios, we see quite an important uh, potential to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the most important contributor here is more intensive use, so the purple uh, part of it, um, but also material substitution. So using wooden buildings instead of brick buildings has an important potential, um, but also higher recycling rates and light weighting and reuse. Um, show an important effect for reduction. So um, here is another way to, to look at these results. I don't want to go too much into the details here. Um, so this is the 2050 result for the SSP1 scenario. Um, so our report mostly deals with the G7 countries, uh, but it also looks at the China and India results. And something I found very interesting in, in the results is that we um, applying our resource efficiency uh, scenarios in 2050, we see a reduction potential of 35%. Comparing that to the China and Indian case, uh, we see a much higher uh, reduction potential. So here we can consider 60% of a reduction potential. That is mostly, or this is uh, basically entirely due to the fact that um, the building stock in India, especially, is still um, developing very fast and very quickly at the moment. The population is increasing uh, much more. So you see a much higher benefit of applying resource efficiency strategies as soon as possible in these countries. So um, with that, i like to conclude. I think um, using this archetype modeling approach was very useful for us. We, we developed our own modeling framework. 
um, which is uh, openly available um, on GitHub. So please check it out and uh, feel free to contribute to the project. We are still working on that. Um, I think we could show like how, how what the potentials are of resource efficiency in the building sector. And I think it's very important to also in the future, we would like to follow up this question. What is the role of the, of the stock and the development of the in different building, um, building stocks? And finally, in future work, we will look into this question, but we also want to co cover more regions and we want to cover different uh, building types also in the future. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nico. Before I let you go, there have been several questions of a similar genre around the, um, the boundary definition in around the system boundary for the wood carbon intensity. Could you speak briefly about land use change inclusions or exclusions? There's several questions on that way. Um, so we, we didn't, uh, hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, we, we have a, a, a carbon model um, encapsulated into this. I think it's best if Stefan Pauliuk explained that because it's part of the stock model. Um, okay. But yeah, it's, it's the, the biogenic carbon is something that is considered in the stock modeling. Well, yes, but also land use, I think, is the other question. So we can, we can take that at the end. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, marvelous. Um, so that was a great framing of the of the building archetypes and how buildings were modeled. And now we get to look at the other key sector that um, that was looked at in, in vehicles. So uh, King Shi, you could bring your slides up all, already. So I next get to introduce uh, King Shi Tu, who's an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia, as well as uh, Paul Wolfram, who's a PhD candidate at Yale University. And as I said, they're gonna tell us about the light duty vehicle assumptions and particularly related to materials efficiency. Take it away. Thank you, Elsa. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Xing Shitu, and uh, my role in this project is actually working with Paul when I was a postdoc at Yale, uh, to uh, uh, specifically working in the vehicle sector for this, for this project. So in today's talk, um, Paul and I will give you a brief introduction on how vehicle archetypes and different material efficiency strategies are modeled for this particular study, as well as showing some of the preliminary results. Um, okay, so just a quick um, refresher on the on the model structure. Uh, you've already seen this. This is the third time, I believe. And we have four uh, different modules. And the first module is the social. Oh, sorry. Is the social economic uh, module where we basically uh, convert the qualitative uh, scenario descriptions into quantitative variables, such as, for example, the annual uh, travel demand in a specific region, archetype split, and also the target and the implementation curve of material efficiency strategies. And the second uh, module is the archetype module, where we provide, um, for example, the material composition of the vehicles and also the fuel economy of vehicles. So, Module one and module two provide information to our Odin rack module, which is the, the one in essential. That's our core module where we calculate, for example, the stock and the flow of different materials. And then also we have the third module where we have the impact, um, like impact and assessment factors, which is linked to the scenario module as well, because we, we, we estimate the future grid, for example, the carbon intensity of electricity in the future, which actually is directly related to the embodied carbon of the vehicle production use and also, um, you know, end of life. Morning, so, 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, so um, with that, I'm gonna hand it to Paul for him to actually talk about the details of the strategies. All right, thank you, Tsingxi. Um, yeah, so you've seen these material efficiency strategies for buildings, and as Tsingxi already mentioned, we have the similar ones for vehicles as well. Um, in particular, we modeled these eight strategies, and I'm starting on the left side. From the top, we have um, a shift to smaller vehicles. Um, on the top left, um, we have we have a strategies of making vehicles lighter by changing the material composition. Um, for example, you can replace steel with aluminum. Um, below that, we have reducing material waste. 
um, increasing the use of recycled materials. And when we go to the right side, um, starting from the top, uh, we can reuse material scraps in areas other than vehicle manufacturing. We have car sharing and ride sharing. Um, we have extending vehicle lifetime and finally reusing entire vehicle components such as tires, engines, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we apply these measures to different individual vehicle types. So for example, as you can see, starting on the very left side, we have internal combustion engine vehicles either running on gasoline or diesel. We have common hybrid EVs. We have plug-in hybrid EVs, which can operate both on gasoline or electricity. Um, then we have fully electric, elect, uh, fully electric EVs and finally hydrogen fuel cell EVs. So we really remodel uh, the range of different established and also emerging propulsion systems. Then if we go to the, to the middle part of this slide, you can see we also considered the most popular vehicle segments. Um, globally, these are quite popular uh, segments. So you can see we have micro cars, passenger cars, light trucks, which are popular in, in the US and in other countries. And we have minivans and sports utility vehicles. And um, on the very right side, you can see that we also considered different manufacturing and design um, techniques. So for example, we use a, uh, we model a conventional, conventional manufacturing design, which is predominant nowadays, and also a lightweighting design, which is gaining popularity due to increasingly tighter fuel economy standards. Next slide, please. Um, now, the first modeling step for Tsingxi and me was to estimate the proportions of different materials used to manufacture the vehicle. Um, you can see on the left side, um, commonly a lot of steel in, you can see those in, in the different shades of blue, is used to produce vehicles nowadays. And because of increasingly tighter fuel economy standards, automakers shift more and more towards lightweight design. And you can see that on the right side. And you can see that a lot of the steel is replaced by aluminum, which you can see in the, in the gray shades. So um, then this material composition helps us to determine the total vehicle weights. Um, and next slide, please. And the total vehicle weight and also other uh, powertrain characteristics for each of these individual powertrains really helps us to determine the onboard energy use. And we use a, another tool. We use a drive cycle simulation tool for this exercise. And here on this slide, you can see some of the results. First of all, if we look at on the left side, we can see internal combustion engine vehicles again. And you can see um, on the, yeah, on the very top that light trucks uh, use a lot of energy to, to be driven. And on the bottom, you can see that micro cars use maybe a third of that roughly. So micro cars are already much more efficient. Uh, when we go to electric vehicles, BEVs, you can see that these require the least amount of energy. Um, and when we look at plug-in hybrids, PHEVs, you can see that they require more energy when they are driven on gasoline, which you can see in, in, the, in the red dots. And they require much less energy when operated on electricity, which you can see uh, in the green dots. And finally, for all of these powertrain options, you can also see there are triangles. Um, and this sh shows you the energy consumption when light weighting is assumed. So when these vehicles are light weighted and you can see that across the board, we can see efficiency gains there 
but especially if we go back to light trucks, um, especially when they are driven on gasoline, we can see the greatest reductions there. And that's it from my side. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tsingxi again, who will show you how these, how the modeling of these individual vehicles is translated to national vehicle fleets. Thank you, Paul. So uh, yeah, let's look at some uh, of the uh, results of the implementation. So uh, the three area plots on the top shows the vehicle stock over the years. Uh, and we, we divide the results into six power chains. Uh, remember, uh, we actually, if you count, count it right, we have 48 different archetypes. And then each color here, for example, the red color uh, represents uh, both, for example, the light weight and the conventional weight, as well as, as four size segments that Paul just talked about uh, for the um, gasoline vehicle. And on the bottom, we can see similar, similarly three um, stock plots here. The difference is that on the bottom, we, we implement the, uh, two strategies. One is the ride sharing, the other one is car sharing. So immediately, I think you can find the reduction of the vehicle stock over the years, which is a direct uh, result of the assumption. For example, in ride sharing, we assume the increase of the uh, vehicle occupancy rate, um, which basically enable, enable us to fulfill the same uh, travel demand uh, with less amount of vehicle that's on the road. Uh, here's another example. Uh, we look at the, the U.S. market, where uh, in this time uh, we are looking at four different uh, size segments. And historically, we can see that the larger vehicles, for example, light truck and SUVs, uh, their market share are actually increasing over time. And the three uh, plots on the bottom are where we implement the downsizing strategy, which means um, we assume the market share of the smaller vehicles, for example, micro car in this case, it's very obvious, will grow from almost zero uh, in like 2016 to about 20% of the market share in under the LED scenario um, if by like 2030. And we have different like target for the other two scenarios. So these are the two examples uh, of implementing uh, different scenarios and how that's gonna affect the vehicle stock. Uh, in different countries. And, and also let's look at the results on the greenhouse gas reduction. So similar to what uh, Nico showed here on the left is the cumulative uh, greenhouse gas reduction for G7 countries. And the gray uh, column here shows the uh, GHG emissions, cumulative emissions when we don't have any material efficiency strategies. But, at, but we do have, for example, decarbonization of electricity over the time under different scenarios. So the reduction you see here are actually on top of, uh, for example, decarbonization of the electricity grid uh, in all these G7 countries. And another way of looking at the data is by years. So if you compare the reduction, the relative reduction in 2050 uh, with the cumulative reduction, you can see that the percentage is actually larger. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the time series of the GHG emissions, um, we will find that this percentage uh, keeps increasing uh, when we go into the future, which indicates the important role of material efficiency uh, as a, uh, a additional uh, approach to further reduce the greenhouse gas emission after we, we kind of like pick the low hanging fruit of decarbonization of the electricity grid. So let's um, zoom deep in into the country level. So those are the four countries where we have the individual contribution of the material efficiency strategies. And we can see that in some cases, the strategies are uh, like universally applicable to all countries. For example, shared mobility, we see that they play a similarly important role in all countries in this case. But in other case, the strategy will be really like uh, country specific. For example, if, if we want to look at how shift in the vehicle size is gonna help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission, and I would like to direct your attention to Japan. As you can see the red part, which is basically uh, downsizing and also under the name of using material, less material by design, um, we can see that the contribution is uh, obviously smaller than the other countries. And there's a reason behind that because when we were doing the uh, scenario assumptions and setting targets, we realized that uh, the, like the smaller vehicles, market share of, for example, microcars uh, is already pretty high in Japan. 
So we, we adjust our target and the implementation curve accordingly. So this is an example of uh, country-specific results uh, under the, the same umbrella of um, the material efficiency strategies. With that, I'm going to wrap up and uh, give it back to Elsa. Thank you so much, uh, Kingshi. That was great. Um, and I, I missed an opportunity to congratulate Paul, who I guess defended his thesis quite yeah. recently. So I should have introduced Dr. Wolfram when I when I was uh, uh, in making the introduction. So congratulations, Paul. Um, that's marvelous. <laughs> Excellent. Good. All right. Well, now we have the framing of our, our building scenarios and our vehicle scenarios uh, and now or our vehicle um, uh, characteristics. And now we can learn about the overall scenarios that were used across both. And we'll learn about that from uh, Tomer Fishman, who's an assistant professor at the Interdisciplinary uh, Center um, in Herlesia, uh, in Israel. Take it away, uh, Tomer. Thank you very much, Elsa. Um, so um, as I got introduced by Elsa, my name is Tomer Fishman. I'm from the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, Israel, um, and I will um, give a very short description of the um, scenario development process uh, for both buildings and light duty vehicles in our uh, research. Um, this uh, effort, it was a group effort by nearly everyone involved in one aspect or the other. Um, we, um, so some of these things were already teased out in the previous uh, um, presentations. Now we're going to go into some more detail um, of how the scenarios were actually created. Um, going back to the overall framework of our research, um, if we actually don't start from the scenarios themselves, but uh, from the part, the modeling aspect that brings everything together, zooming in into that, um, it's a quite sophisticated model that um, includes um, aspects all the way from the demand for a certain service through demand for products um, and that um, gets translated into material cycles and um, after that energy and emissions um, and the uh, various um, um, material efficiency strategies are implemented in different parts of this uh, model. So um, what we wanted to do was to create par parameters that vary by scenario in order to be able to have counterfactual, um, say, um, alternative futures in which we can compare how much each of these um, strategies can actually have an influence on those different countries. This leads to um, a set of um, scenario parameters that vary based on the scenario in which they are used. The values are different for different countries uh, and over time, but also um, depending on which scenario we are looking at, which of those alternative futures we're looking at. Um, so first of all, what we wanted to do was to come up with scenario narratives that would be meaningful to, for comparison, but also um, relevant to the bigger sustainability uh, discourse. So we started with the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs, which have uh, five different uh, scenarios of different futures that the world can go into uh, from a socioeconomic perspective. There are also environmental and energy perspectives uh, beyond that. Uh, but out of these five, we actually selected only SSP1, the sustainability taking the green road scenario and SSP2, the middle of the road scenario, as two scenarios that are meaningful for material efficiency strategy implementations. The other three are not necessarily different in this aspect or maybe irrelevant for material efficiency strategies. And to compare with these two strategies, we also went for um, another existing scenario, the low energy demand scenario, LED, which is a more extreme scenario on trying to um, show how meeting the 1.5 degree Celsius target and the SDG goals can be achieved without uh, negative emission technologies. Um, and we wanted to use that as another, a third scenario with which to compare the two SSPs. 
So once we had these three scenarios, we started basically populating values for the different um, parameters that are required, both the socioeconomic parameters and the material efficiency parameters, because it turns out that um, these scenarios that are appearing here on the screen, for, in, for the most part, don't go into these details. So we had to basically fill in these details um, as they become manifest, as they manifest and uh, in a relevant way to each of those scenarios. I will only give one um, short example of how this was done. It was a, a mixture of um, uh, data-driven um, uh, approaches to understand the historical pathways and potential futures, fitting them into a relevant scenario, uh, and um, a combination of other approaches, including experts, advice, and, um, and discussions in order to uh, provide values for the different uh, uh, parameters for each, um, each scenario and each country. Um, once this was done for certain key uh, years, mostly in 10-year um, um, gaps, we interpolated the values in between to create a, a full time series from now until 2050, 2060, uh, when needed for the various uh, uh, countries that we looked at. Um, this approach um, uh, helped us uh, then come up with values, and I will show you some of these starting values um, uh, for the three different scenarios that we look at. For instance, floor space per capita in the G7 countries, China and India um, up to 2060. You can see that in each of the three scenarios, um, the values either converge to certain values, stay uh, the same in SSP1, or continue to increase depending on the country and its potential for increase. Um, so there are some similarities, but also differences between countries and across uh, the different scenarios. Um, for vehicles, um, these are the mobility service provision parameters, uh, combinations of uh, the uh, passenger kilometers driven by people, by vehicles and the vehicle occupancy rate, all of which can be changed um, with material efficiency strategies too. These lead to per capita vehicle stocks um, that are the baseline for each of these three scenarios. And you can see the differences between the different countries and uh, between the scenarios uh, appearing here. Um, and similarly for the material efficiency implementations, um, these are just um, uh, representative examples of the potentials of these uh, material efficiency uh, strategies to be implemented in the different scenarios. Um, I will note, for example, here in the case of uh, buildings, that for example, in the LED scenario, more intensive use, you can see here, um, there is no change um, since in that specific scenario, for instance, um, it is assumed that um, it's already built in, in to the baseline scenario. Um, and there would not be any potential for any further but in the more uh, intensive use implementation because it's already at uh, maximum technical and uh, socioeconomic capacity. Um, similarly, these are the material efficiency potentials for implementation um, in the case of uh, vehicles. Um, and these are reached by 2060 in the various um, scenarios once we start implementing those material efficiency strategies. So they are not turned on by default. Um, but this is a very, very quick um, uh, description of the process that we um, had in order to create the scenario parameters, um, which then feed into the other um, parts of the, um, uh, of the project, of the framework. And I will just uh, summarize that our priorities when uh, developing these scenarios were, first of all, that uh, these parameters and uh, their storylines would remain consistent with the SSP and LED narratives that are already out there, which would make them a um, first step towards filling in the gaps in those scenarios for the material cycles that are um, in, um, uh, in a large um, manner still missing from those scenarios. Um, Another priority that we had was uh, to make sure that um, 
the material efficiency strategies are viable in each scenario in context of the history of the specific country, the future timeframes, um, the different regions that we are discussing, and that they still are consistent with the specific scenario narrative. Um, we wanted to minimize black box factors or assumptions and go directly to the source as much as possible. And um, it was still important for us to uh, maintain a balance between model complexity and covering every aspect, but um, uh, and abstraction um, in uh, at the same time. Um, if you'd like to know more about the scenario formulation process, we have uh, a new study um, that was just accepted for publication in the Journal of Industrial Ecology that details everything that I described um, in uh, much more detail and includes all of the necessary data and information. The preprint is available in the link um, here uh, in, the, um, in the slide. And um, you will also be able to see there that uh, that publication already takes it a few steps further by expanding this approach to further regions on the global level um, and uh, as into more complexity uh, in the scenario formulation process. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. And um, I'll give the stage back to Elsa now. Great, thank you so much, Tomer. As you as you point out the end there, much of uh, there's a lot of scholarship behind all of what is being talked about today, and so lots of other resources for folks to consult as they have questions uh, throughout. So we look forward to to further questions in our discussion time. But obviously, there's a wealth of information to pour into as well. Thank you so much, Tomer. Great. So we've heard about the the um, products that went into it, the scenarios, and now we we're going to pull it all together through the modeling itself. And so I I get to now introduce uh, Stefan Pollock, who's an assistant professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany, and he's going to talk to us about uh, the the modeling framework. So tracing the material thro flows through product cohorts uh, and the framework for assessing resource use. So please, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction, Elsa, and hello, everybody. We will now see how we put it all together, how we can actually model those different resource efficiency and material efficiency strategies all across the material and product cycle and estimate their resource savings and climate mitigation potential. What we have here is a sequence of computation that we do. And to be honest, nothing of what we do is actually new. Other people have expanded scenario storylines. Other people have modeled archetypes and so on. New is that we are very comprehensive in scope. We don't model a single vehicle. We model representative vehicle types in different light weighting options. The same for buildings. And for the scenario, we have a comprehensive approach for different regions and many scenario parameter. This is one big novelty. And the other one is we put it all together. And by doing so, we fill a critical gap between individual life cycle assessments, where most of what we do would be done already, right? Scaling up archetypes, sorry, assessing archetypes and their material implications and the aggregated scenario models that often take a GDP scenario and directly translate it into energy demand for that particular sector. So what we do here can be seen as kind of a large scale scenario based life cycle assessment or a big material cycle mid product cycle study that is linked to individual life cycle impact assessment. And the way it works is that we go down the so-called energy service cascade. We start with a demand for a certain function or service. This is, for example, passenger kilometers or a comfortable building space. Population scenario times one of these factors that Tomer just described gives you the total service demand for a given region and year. Then we have a scenario parameter on the technology mix, what type of vehicles are going to be used and so on. For, from this, we get the uh, information of how much we have to operate our product, like building, cooling hours and heating days, vehicle operation. Once we have the so-called intensity of use parameters, for example, how many kilometers a vehicle drives every year, we can calculate the stocks that we need to supply all the services. Simplest example is we know how many passenger kilometers we have divided by the number of people per car divided by the kilometers per car, we get the number of vehicles that we need. 
we can translate because we know the composition of the product stocks this directly into the material stock and we can then use the lifetime modeling to add the whole material cycle that is needed to build up these stocks over time and also we can see what can be recycled from it in the environmental extension step we can then calculate the energy demands for those different process stages and also the environmental impacts and all this is implemented in a dynamic MFA software that was specifically developed for this project because we have to deal with all these different data sets in a consistent manner and not get too messy about it. So we have a software framework that everything can be done consistently and efficiently to build up all these different layers. So we have this resource efficiency climate change mitigation model implemented in this ODOM MFA software. And this is the this acronym ODOM REC that we're here using. A little bit more detail. Now the top level of this cascade, right? We have this scenario input there, purple here. We have the material efficiency strategy potential that are actual factors that change over time, that change the parameters over time. And we have these product archetypes, what King Shi, Paul and Nico presented, right? The actual mass and energy balance consistent description of individual vehicles and buildings are scaled up to model how the total stock in a given country or region will look like vehicles and buildings. And we then in the bottom line have the material cycle impacts, right, where we know how much vehicles we produce. So we know how much material is in there. We know how much is being recycled from the old vehicles. So this is a typical dynamic MFA. And then we have the energy flow extension. What we model at this time in terms of environmental impact is only the resource extraction, so the raw material input and the greenhouse gas emissions, because this is the scope of the study. So we do not include any land use, although this is one of the obvious things to include in the future. We'll talk about this later. This kind of answers the questions about the, the carbon cycle and forest modeling. So with that, I want to finish here and hand over to Edgar, who will present the main results. So I just wanted to tell you about, uh, you know, how this story f went when we presented it as part of the International Resource Panel Report. And so these are really the headline results. Uh, next slide. Um, so what we basically looked at was these two products, first the buildings. Uh, we looked at the emissions in 2016. Uh, for the G7 countries, and you can see the G7 countries um, uh, on the lower bottom uh, left. And here we have emissions associated with the material cycle uh, in orange and the emissions associated with the operational energy use and other energy use in the building life cycle in green. Um, as a background to our scenario, of course, we assume a decarbonization of the energy system and an increase in energy efficiency. So a roughly two degree consistent pathway uh, that brings those emissions down by 2050. However, they don't go down as far as they should. Uh, ideally, we would need to reach zero, right? Um, and so next, um, we implement those material efficiency strategies then on top of the energy efficiency and, and clean energy strategies. And we achieve a further reduction of emissions by 35%. Uh, emissions reductions associated with the production of material are as important as the reductions in energy use. Uh, next slide. Uh, in China and India, the picture is quite different. There is more construction going on. Um, there's less need for operational energy use because there is less need for heating and cooling requires less energy. Uh, also here, there is a slowing down of the construction rate and a cleaning up of the energy system that contributes to a substantial reduction of emissions. However, not sufficient for our climate ambitions. Uh, next. And the implementation of the material efficiency strategies actually has a much larger potential uh, because materials are so important uh, and contributing uh, to a significant share of the 60% potential emission reductions. These are reductions 
uh, in emissions happening in 2050 related to the different steps of the life cycle that occur in 2015 of the buildings. And buildings are, of course, longer lived products. Uh, so their life cycle stretches through many years. Next slide. If we then look at the different strategies, this is going back to the G7 countries. Uh, what you actually see is that there are some strategies that have a much larger contribution than other strategies. Uh, and it's really uh, interesting to see uh, how uh, the purple part, which is actually more intensive use, uh, is by far the largest and most important strategy uh, because of the reduction of the energy related uh, emissions uh, due by that strategy and not the other strategies. Um, and so in our case, with, with the current way the model runs, product lifetime extension has, for example, very little um, gains because um, it sort of delays the introduction of more efficient technologies. Uh, next slide. And this is now for the vehicles. Here, operational energy use is much more important. The introduction of those uh, clean fuels uh, and so on, as Ching Shi has, has shown, uh, also uh, reduces emissions and introduction of electric vehicles, uh, mostly, and, and clean energy for that. Uh, and, uh, and next slide, uh, material efficiency strategies can reduce 40% of the emissions Again, the emissions reductions uh, happen um, for, from both aspects, but mostly related here to direct emission energy use. Next slide. And here we have uh, the situation for vehicles in uh, China and India. Here we assume that um, they will be driven more. Today, these vehicles, at least in China, are not driven very far. Uh, and uh, there will be a lot more of them. And so that's why the emissions increase despite the shift to clean energy next. And um, here also emissions can be reduced by 35%. Uh, next, there's a much wider range of strategies that is available. Um, and so you can see that uh, actually it is uh, the ride sharing uh, in deep uh, purple and the car sharing that are the most important strategies. And then having smaller cars, so shifting from, uh, for example, light trucks to SUVs and from SUVs to regular passenger vehicles uh, could provide uh, some savings. Uh, and uh, that was the end of uh, my next. Stefan, I would like to hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Edgar. So now that we have seen not only the different parts of the model framework, but also how it fits all together and what the results look like in the end, I want to give a quick outlook on what we have planned next, and then we will start the discussion with you. So on this first tier of the service cascade, from service demand to product stocks, we would like at some point to connect our now open-ended scenarios to a common formulation. Right now, the vehicle scenarios and the building scenarios are independent of each other, but they will be linked to low carbon lifestyles at some point. And this is really a, an important approach that we want to tackle. And this is definitely also a community effort because so many people will have to contribute to such scenarios and we'll be able to use them. That of course means we will want to expand our sectoral scope, especially including the non-residential buildings and the infrastructure, because then we would have the entire urban fabric covered. Finally, the material efficiency and demand side strategies we have should be better connected to the actual policy targets. For example, we use a lifetime parameter for buildings in our model, but policy usually talks in terms of demolition and renovation rates. So we might want to adjust our model equations to actually really depict the things that policymakers want to talk about. 
the modal split between transport and infrastructure and also infrastructure is important right right now we only have the passenger vehicles but of course there's lots of other transport including public transport going on and if we want to talk about rebound effects which was included quite a few times in the questions already we will have to add costs at the moment it is not a priority simply because this would be a major effort that we don't see we would have the resources but this is definitely also crucial and of course inserting new technologies is something that we want to talk on. then downwards material cycles to energy to impacts of course, at some point, it would be good if such detailed models capture the entire metal demand that we really can see okay, in which sectors the metal will go in the future and where will it come back as scrap. Having environmental impact indicators other than the ones we capture already is definitely important, especially the land footprint that was mentioned already as well. And then not only we would like to realistically depict individual strategies, but actually the strategy bundles, right? Meaning that in the future, there will be a co-design of different strategies. For example, we can't transform our vehicle fleet while not only at the same time also transforming our energy supply. And the same here, right? We will have to see how longer building lifetimes and more efficient housing, like lower square meters per person will get work together in different urban settings. So this needs to be assessed in an integrated manner. And also then here the cost layer would be quite relevant next to then working towards more the let's say material specific questions additional alloying elements specialty elements that can be traced here as well and also then the contamination the um, circular economy scenario with the different tramp elements would be relevant to study in such a framework. This whole project is an open science effort the model code is available the database is available both from the input side and the result side and at some point we even think this could be kind of a community tool because there's we, we have data sets like the 2015 stock of residential and non-residential buildings in all the different countries highly disaggregated this is a data set that only needs to be compiled once and it would be good if at some point we can build up a community database on such parameters that then can be used by different efforts and also mutually improved. With this, I would like to thank you and give back the word to our host Elsa to start the discussion. Marvelous. Thank you so much, Stefan, and, and to all of the speakers for giving uh, such a nice overview, as well as a lot of good detail on the work that's gone in. So one of the, the marvels of us all learning Zoom worlds better is that we've had a lot of discussion through the chats as well and furthered the discussion um, in written as well as spoken form. Um, so I want to just pick up a couple of the threads um, that were that were talked about throughout, um, you know, some some questions around uh, modeling frameworks and assumptions um, that, that folks have commented on so if people had questions and they hadn't looked at uh, looked at the answers yet some of that has been been answered um i think that stefan you you laid out this a very critical uh point of departure in in one of the goals in the model uh set up so far has been to to make it so that it could be a collaborative effort and and build you know build into continuing effort to the community and you particularly cited the need to add economic information in order for us to be able to get to things like rebound and maybe consider some more of the indirect effects um that would be then associated with with that so you you laid that out as future work but i wonder if, if Edgar and Stefan, you could also comment on on how you feel the the, the current results, the the robustness of the current results rel relative to to some of the indirect um, effects that have come up in questions around land use and um, and rebound, uh, given given the where things stand now. Yeah, uh, of course the this is not the complete model of the entire economy right we don't model e either the budget of individual households or, or the whole production and so as that it's not a model to really model the rebound effect which i think you would need to you know that happens in other parts of the economy basically so the assumptions we have made for example for car sharing implies that there will be less cars used and of course, then there is an option uh, for people who save money on uh, on car trips to spend the money somewhere else, right? And that, that's something we haven't taken into account. But of course, there's the question whether there will be really more money or are we just looking at 
you know, a different societal de development. And so I think in, in the uh, sort of scenario context, this uh, rebound effect uh, needs to be dealt with differently if, than if you had a, a static investigation, just a static model that looked at the, uh, an instantaneous response to a marginal change. Um, but I think scientifically, it's a quite relevant question to ask for the scenarios. It's just like one of the things on our to-do list that I think can be achieved by including this type of modeling in the more macro level model. And, and that is something that I would imagine that within the scope of the resource panel, for example, will, will happen at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether anybody else would like to speak to that. Yeah, maybe Stefan, did you have a comment? Yes. Um, just an alternative way of tackling the rebound is not going via the economic rebound, but actually via these urban scenarios, meaning that we want to describe low carbon lifestyles that are consistent in a way that, for example, we have the time budget of the people all divided into work, sleep, travel, leisure, and so on. Um, it's almost an ideological debate on whether everything should be GDP based or we do something decoupled from GDP, which we here deliberately did to then a little bit avoid this ideology in the post growth debate right at some point just describing hopefully attractive sustainable futures and then later on relink to an economic budget closure approach, but only as one way of looking at the problems. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very nice framing of it. We can make a philosophical choice about where we want to, uh, where we want to be headed, and how we want to be having our decisions governed, and or or you know the the uh, external factors playing into our how we make our decisions. And so um, you know that that then could point to a modeling choice. So guy, guy, you know, leading leading by modeling choice. I like that as a framing, Stefan. Um, so I, I I have another kind of question for the panel, but before that, I'm sure. Uh, there, we heard from many panelists, but so I want to make sure that if folks had comments that they wanted to make either on this rebound question or even um, summary comments you wanted to make based on on uh, questions that have come in, that please unmute any of the panelists and, and pop in with with any summary thoughts you had. Um, is there are there things that that uh, any of the earlier speakers wanted to comment on based on the dialogue in the in the Q and A? Good. Um, well, please weigh in if you want. So I was, um, this is a little bit um, maybe to uh, Nico and um, and Kingshi and, and Paul in, in, in the spirit of the way that Stefan outlined this open science um, framework uh, you know, at, that this work has been developed around. I wonder if you could speak to, um, you know, data and how you think that data could be uh, you know, we we always talk about you know sharing of data and 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 needing better data, needing more data, and the sort of grassroots needs to build up data through the experience of working on this report and developing the frameworks um, for the vehicles and buildings, and then using that into into what Stefan had done in terms of the open science modeling. Can you comment on on what you think the community needs to to do to make data data as bountiful as we want it to be? Uh, I, I can give you my personal take. Um, I think one of the exceptional things we did in this project was really to, to work, work in a very open fashion. So as Stefan just said, like the input data is public, the models are there, um, the configuration files to run these models to produce the exact results or the results all there. Um, I think <clears throat> this, is, this is a great achievement here. And I think we, we will be pushing more in this in the future. Um, but there's also like spin-off, little spin-off projects. So um, Stefan uh, and myself and, and a few others, we we, uh, we developed a, a database for um, data commons, so industrial uh, ecology data commons. So um, it is in a harmonized data format. You find uh, stock data, you find uh, archetype data, all this kind of stuff. Um, Tomer and I, we worked on uh, com compiling material uh, intensity values for buildings. Um, and I think, what, so I'm seeing a lot of people picking up on this and reusing this data, but I think our, our key job here was we, we didn't really invent the data, we just collected it and harmonized it. And I think this harmonization step, this is very, very important and crucial here. And, and yeah, putting it on GitHub, I think is, is the best thing you can do, making it open for people to contribute, uh, pull and, and uh, upload stuff again. And this collaborative um, aspect, I think this is something I would really like to see more in the future. 
Yeah, I agree I, that there starts to be a bit of a shift of people being more willing to put in the overhead that it takes to be able to share them in an interoperable way. So if we all continue to, to emphasize that and we can't say it enough, then I think I think you're right that we'll start to get there. Good. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Paul or Kingshi, did you want to add? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I just want to add a little bit to uh, what Nico just said. Yes, we, we definitely want to encourage this like open science and the, the sharing of the results. And as a matter of fact, uh, most of the, uh, we try to use as many open source, for example, models or data set as possible for the, for the project. For example, for vehicles, we, uh, for the fuel economy, we use um, the fast sim simulation tool that developed by NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And also for, for example, the material substitution, uh, we, we uh, rely, uh, we kind of rely on the great uh, vehicle cycle model and how to understand their assumptions for, you know, for example, substituting steel with aluminum with certain like limitation on like certain vehicle parts. So all these are available online and we try to document that as transparent as possible in the relevant publications. And we do encourage people uh, to do the same and then we welcome, for example, um, collaboration, uh, especially for example, uh, for the vehicle material substitution. If there's there's new data for different vehicle archetypes, we're more than happy to actually uh, take a look and hopefully integrate that into our database that Nico just mentioned. Marvelous. Thank you so much, uh, King Shi. Um, so lots of lots of calls for, for continued uh, framing and you know spending the time to think about how we present our data so that we can we can use it across um so we have a, a question in the chat from um gang lu so first hello gang um I, I i quite like your question so i'll i'll kind of pose it in in uh to the group here so um i think that you know part of uh, and maybe this is evocative of the way that stefan left us right with these sort of circles of many different ways we want to develop the models out and have them become more complex and more layered um and you know start to consider uh transition in technology et cetera, et cetera. and so with that we as we increase model complexity to try to you know have more uh, rich results from these models uh, we have to also keep in mind how we are um, communicating the results and communicating the assumptions that go into the results. So I wonder, um, perhaps Edgar, in, in the presentations that were done um, within the IRP um, or in your own experience and in, in involvement with IRP, do you have thoughts of how to sort of balance this trade-off between model complexity, which we need, and but then making sure that we can still convey to, to users and stakeholders, as, as Gang says, um, you know, how do we communicate results in a way that people have confidence in them. Yeah, I think that's really, you're, you're putting it the right way. So, so I don't think the users need to understand all the details of the models in, in order to have confidence. And, you know, I've worked on, on the IPCC with the models that are being used by the climate change community, which are much comp more complex in, in the sense than what, what we're doing here. Um, the it is about doing tests of the models and see whether you know you can explain what goes on in the model and see whether it makes sense and that's really something that we need to do ourselves and so i can see you know i think it would be great if somebody devised better tests of how we could can test the model and see you know whether the outcome actually appears correct of course, we have that the core, there's a mass balance model. You, so you can check whether the mass is in is equal to the mass out. Um, you, you can, you know, derive, for example, the average lifetime of the product in your model and see whether that corresponds to the assumptions you've made about the lifetimes of products. And, and so you, you can do a, a few of those things. And it really helps the work that the paper that, that uh, Paul and Chingji had on, on the sort of unit level results, looking at individual cars and comparing cars to each other, you can build the intuition to then uh, say whether your fleet model actually makes sense. So, so those things are very helpful. In, in, and I really encourage everybody who is working with this type of modeling to make these, these kind of, kinds of exercises because you know, it has happened to all of us. There are errors in, in our work. And so we need a, a, an error detection procedure and make, make sure that, uh, uh, that you know, there, there's a way by which these errors can be corrected. Um, what I also see is that as we do this research, 
we sort of find strategies that can be effective, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the more, the higher level models, the macro level models. And so one, you know, could imagine we interact with the macro level model, but that probably uh, happens by us uh, describing what we do in a simplified manner and, and that being represented in the model in a simplified manner, right? And not the full complexity of the model uh, entering an integrated assessment model or, or, or a computational general equilibrium model. So that's what, what I think um, the direction should be. Great. So there are a couple of things there that I found really interesting, Edgar. One, it's speaking to the the um, discussion we were just having around sort of data and, and sharing is that the more we can have these data sets that are interoperable or models that, you know, that that are open source, you know, there's a further incentive there of, of the community being able to to use and and you know use their own data, test their own scenarios and build confidence that way. So there, there's sort of further incentive for that that approach. And then the other thing that, that you said is that you um it would be great or you, you want to uh have people continue to develop ways of testing, which is a lesson that I've seen a lot in, in our work in when we touch the computer science community is there's a yes. you know, lot of good quality benchmark data sets that all those models are run against. Um, I think it's nice to also have these sort of more interesting applied cases, but that sort of balance between benchmarking and, and codification of that, I think beginning to take that on more as a community, there's there's value there. Um, and then the, what you just were speaking about is, is you know, the kind of having models work across length scales, right, that we sort of are able to parameterize directionally both ways um, to, you know, up into the larger macro level models down into the into the more granular agent based you know, sort of framing. Um, and, and, and that's another kind of validation or another kind of confidence building. Um, so those both seem like pretty actionable um, ideas for the community, which I which I quite like. Good. Well, just yes, I'm please. One story, you know, we, we, we were looking now to do the non-residential buildings. And so we have been looking for data sets that describe how much non-residential floor space there is in different countries. So we found that our colleagues purchased the data set from a, a commercial data provider. So we looked at that data set and there it's wonderful. It has like on, on every country, it has different types of non-commercial building space going to 2028. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and then I got the description and it's sort of, it's not described how the data set was derived. Okay. Uh, I can only, you know, think that it is uh, model data, right? But the model equation and the training set for uh, is not available, and, and so we, we see that this is being has been used uh, in the in the, the modeling community, um, and and I think you know if if that's my only way to get make progress, maybe I use it. But at the same time, I know that. I don't, I don't understand the piece of my model, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really like that very well. And I think as a community, we should at least flag this issue and say, well, somebody needs to derive an open source model that, that, that provides an estimate of a floor space by purpose across the world. And so mm -hmm. that seems like a clear research need. And so we run across these several examples of research needs to, to do this type of modeling. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. That's perfect. Good. I want to make sure if others of the panelists um, want to make a, a final comment. We we are going to close here in about a minute, but if there's other folks who want to say it, I, I think it's good, uh, Edgar, that you and I are both in, in our sunny virtual worlds here, but I'm sure it doesn't look like that outside in either of the places that we currently are. So it's nice to hang out with you in this lovely virtual land. Um, any final comments from any of the panelists? Great. Good. Well, there was lots of nice dialogue, and as it's come up a couple of times in the chats um, and in the Q and A, the, the the recording will be made available through the registrants of the of the webinar, as well as posted to the NTNU Sustainability Channel, so you can check that out. Um, and lots of good future work. So I I hope um, we get the community together. And a reminder to you all that the the policy framing um, part of this uh, this report will be uh, presented next week, and there's a lot of richness to that as well. So please uh, join us for that. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for hosting us, Elsa. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Good. All right. Have a wonderful days and evenings and, and sleeps, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Elsa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.